good morning, good afternoon to you. Hey, uh, hey Ross, so which is your favourite in, uh, British indie band then? Ah, uh, very good, thank you for asking, Brett. I used to be a very big uh, Blur and Oasis fan, but... Uh, All right. They sort of dropped off the radar a little bit, although Blur have just got back together again, which I'm very excited yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. You, do you still, because you live in the States now, don't you, Britt? Yes, I live in, in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. um, California, yeah. but I go, you know, I go to England quite a bit because my son's there, and in fact, I just got a brand new baby girl granddaughter. Oh, wow. <laughs> and is she a Thomas the Tank Engine fan? Well, she's only just a week old. Oh, so, so she's a bit too. It's a bit like my one-year-old at the moment. A little bit too young yet to uh, to fully comprehend, I suppose. Yeah. Britt, can you believe it's 25 years since it first appeared on TV? You know, I, when I heard that you you wanted to do this, I sort of can and I can't. You know, on the one hand, it's so much has happened, but um, in some ways, it just you know you blink your eyes and yeah. I'm right back there. <laughs> Take me back. Take me back, Britt. 25 years ago, although, well, in fact, uh, it was a few years before that, wasn't it, when you first yeah. toyed, toyed with your idea. How did it come about? Okay, well, I was actually making a little documentary about the British love affair with steam trains, you know, big, uh, real, in quotes, steam trains. Mm. And um, during my research, I came across uh, an article about the Reverend Wilbur Audrey and uh, his creation from the 1940s, because Thomas, in book form, the you know, which was the railway series of books, um, I'd never, I'd never seen them when I was little myself, because they weren't, they weren't really that well known. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anyway, we we got chatting, and I and I looked at these little books. At that time, there were just 26 of these very small books with very simple text and just beautiful watercolour paintings for illustrations. And I said to him, you know, I really would love to bring these to life. Yeah. And um, little did I know, and that, can you believe, that was actually 1979. Mm. So we're talking, <laughs> my, we're talking 30 years ago now, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and my own kids were, were really tiny. Um, and that's how it began, and it, it's hard probably to imagine now, but it was it was pretty hard. To I had a very clear idea of, of how I, I wanted the stories to look on the screen, uh, the home screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it was tough to raise the money, really tough, because I wanted to make them as beautifully as I could. Of course. Um, and that nothing like that usually comes cheap. No. Um, so, ha so how did you go about it? How did you go about raising the money? I suppose it's just going, walking and knocking doors and oh, saying, I've got this wonderful idea. All sorts of directions, and a lot of it would have meant, um, you know, losing complete creative control and all mm -hmm. that. And I, I, they were really thought of like, a, you know, I was making a present for little children. Um, so I wanted to be sure that I could make them the way I wanted to make them. Yes. And eventually, um, we got the money from my local bank, but we had to mortgage everything along the way, not the least um, the house. Mm. And um, it also took about three years, I guess, to find the right team who could bring to life what was in my head. And I... I looked at lots of different forms of animation, and then someone said to me, you know, there's a guy who's doing a lot of commercials, and he's got a yogurt commercial on at the moment, and I said, what's that got to do with, you know, steam trains? But I actually looked at this commercial, and I met him, and of course it turned out to be David Mitten, who became my um, long-term collaborator. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thomas. And we shot Thomas eventually in what's called live action model animation throughout, you know, the classic series of the first one, 130 films. Because, uh, it would seem to me, uh, I'm a novice in this area, obviously, but there would have been much easier ways to shoot it, much easier ways to do the animation than, than how you eventually did it. Uh, probably. Um, I just knew that what, what I cared about was, was that uh, little children who were sitting at, at home, maybe on their own, or maybe with the, with one of the family, or maybe a carer, or whatever, 
would really feel that this world existed. The island of yes. Tador and all these steam trains and, and Bertie and so on. And that they could be there, that they could go there. And so this idea of a almost like a three you know, a three dimensional world that had um, a fantasy but also a reality mixed up in it. That was what I needed, and certainly in those days, CGI was in its infancy, and I found it very cold. Um, yes. It didn't have the soul. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so coming up with this idea, well, what we'll do is we'll have real little trains puffing along, and we'll shoot them in real time. It gave us some discipline, uh, like if we were going to do that, then characters like the Fat Controller mm. um, open would not move in that way but the wonderful thing was that children's imagination was what I was all about giving them space for their imagination that they could sit there and watch these stories and at the same time there would be enough freedom in these stories for little kids to use their imagination Look, it wasn't just little kids, Britt. Let me say, there was a few fathers there who daydreamed of, <laughs> yes, feet, right. of, of Sodor being a real place where one day they could escape to. I <laughs> know, uh, and I still, I get a lot of emails still. And, and what's also great is that, you know, little kids who would write to me, unbelievably, 25 years ago, um, I, I, would, I, I keep every letter and every, every little painting or whatever it was and what's really cool now is that some of these guys who are like four write to me again and they write with a different kind of perspective. Yeah. You know, not with a child's perspective, but with the, the grown-up for whom Thomas was such an important part of their childhood. Britt, uh, how did you get Ringo Starr involved? How did that come about? Because he was the voice, of course, uh, yes. for so long. Yes. Well, I wanted the story to be told as intimately as possible and, and in a way as an extension of the way that um, a little kid like would sit on um, Granny's lap or whoever and gra Grandpa's lap and, and hear these stories told in a very intimate way. So I didn't actually want a cast of, of voices um, at, at that time. And I listened. It took me months. I, I listened to all sorts of voices and none of them seemed to be right and then you know serendipity or whatever played a big part because it was a saturday night i remember that and um the family were in the family room and they were watching uh, television and i wasn't in the room and i was going past the door and i heard this voice i thought who's that and that's it that's the voice and I went into the room, and uh, Ringo was being interviewed on a British chat show. I think it was Michael Parkinson. Yeah, yeah. So I've that right. Um, and I said, that's it. That's it. It's Ringo. 